I'm an associate professor of computer science and engineering here at the University of Michigan. And I am very excited to be moderating our final session, a uh, panel discussion with four experts on the topic of collaboration versus automation, the role of AI in healthcare. And this builds very nicely off of Dr. Jaw's talk in which he talked about how people perhaps unnecessarily or selfishly panic about AI replacing clinicians. So with that, I'd like to invite each panelist to briefly introduce themselves. So hi everyone, I'm Emily Provost. I'm an associate professor also in computer science. And my area is focused on how we can use speech to better understand behavior. And for a long time, what that meant was focusing on how emotion can be recognized from speech, which is fun because there's so much subjectivity. And so there are a lot of questions about how machine learning algorithms can be designed to handle that type of subjectivity. But it's also so exciting because as it turns out, emotion and other aspects of our behavior are all sensible through speech. And they allow us to ask really interesting questions about how these types of behaviors change as health status changes. And so for the last uh, oh, almost nine years, but about eight and a half years, we've been focused on looking at how we can use speech patterns and more recently emotion and language patterns to understand mood transitions for people with bipolar disorder as they go through their day. And from an AI perspective, again, super interesting because it's a very hard problem, but from a health perspective, what it means is that every time we have our algorithms that are doing something effective, not only are we learning a little bit more about health, but we're also building technology that allow people to have agency over their own health. And so it's just a really exciting area to be in. Great, thank you, Emily. Joyce? Hi, my name is Joyce Lee. I am a pediatric endocrinologist here at University of Michigan, um, but I also, I'm a health services researcher by trade, so I've done a lot of work in type 1 diabetes and obesity research. Um, I uh, have a number of roles as a CMIO for pediatric research, um, do a lot of work with the electronic health record and um, see the potential of AI for my clinical population, which is diabetes. It's probably the most data-driven disease that you could ever imagine, but I can tell you that we have a lot of difficulties with um, even getting individuals to download their devices before visits. And we still have a lot of PDFs uh, with diabetes data going into electronic health records so we can use them. So I believe that we have a long way to go. Um, and I do direct sort of a new area of research that's uh, focused with the Caswell Diabetes Institute on um, just kind of leveraging diabetes data um, and in the system, in the electronic health record system, as well as sort of applying it for clinical innovation. Great, thank you. John? Okay, thanks. My name is John Laird. I'm a faculty member in computer science and engineering. I've been here at Michigan for many years. Uh, my research is sort of hardcore artificial intelligence, and the subfield that I'm in is called cognitive architecture, where we're interested in putting all the pieces of cognition together, all the way from perception to action, with reasoning and learning in between. So we care a lot about how different aspects of cognition fit together, such as different kinds of memories and decision making, and not focusing on any one technology um, alone, but really thinking hard about how the integration is possible. We're inspired a lot by um, how humans think, um, and so the structure of the mind and how that is mapped onto the brain. I am not an expert in any aspect of medicine, so I'm going to become an outsider here, and we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, what we can do with that. So I uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, John. And last but not least, Ella? Hi, my name is Ella Kazaruni. I'm a cardiothoracic radiologist here at the University of Michigan. My background here is the Cardiovascular Center where I would usually be physically present um, in uh, normal times, uh, but coming to you from home today. Uh, I have been very interested in how advanced technologies interplay with radiology and the uh, electronic health record more broadly. I see, I've always seen imaging as a, um, an entree into public health. Um, some of the meetings, interestingly, that I've been participating this week are all about lung cancer, COPD, and population health, um, quantitative imaging, and how we can identify 
diseases that people didn't know they have, and then asking the question, what's the value of information about, what's the value of information you never asked for, and how will you interact with that information to make those meaningful changes in public health? Um, so I've been grateful to uh, work with a lot of my pulmonary medicine colleagues here at, at Michigan, um, as well as our basic scientists to help develop some tools to extract information out of imaging. I like to say extract things that we didn't know were there in a way we didn't know we could see um, and to try and continue to move that forward. So I'm uh, a, a super believer in moving technology and AI forward um, and trying to figure out how that will best intersect so that we make, make a positive difference. Great, thank you everyone. And I wanted to remind um, the attendees, the audience, that they can submit questions um, using the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, I'm going to ask all the panelists to unmute themselves, because um, I think otherwise I have to keep going in and tell you to unmute yourself. So we'll keep it informal, more of a discussion. Um, and if you need to mute yourself, that's fine. Um, so I wanted to kick it off um, with a question um, where we, let's suppose we imagine um, ourselves 50 years from now, um, how do we expect AI will have transformed what it means to be a doctor? What are all the different ways that AI may transform healthcare? Um, and in particular, what tasks will likely disappear or be added? Um, let's start there. And I can call on someone or someone can volunteer. <laughs> I can start. Um, so, I mean, I can think about the example for us um, in the enterprise of diabetes. And there's a lot of medical decision making that goes on that perhaps still relies to a certain extent on the physician. But I mean, I think one of the key pieces of AI and computation in general is that um, ideally it should be helping our patients self-manage, right? So we know that the more often patients look at their data and the more often they make changes in their data, the better their glycemic outcomes, which means a healthier and happier life. But I would say that the reality of this, uh, we are very far from that. And it, and it really does start with how do these systems actually um, take that work um, support the patient and or the family or caregiver in that, and actually to a great extent, remove the physician from pieces of that. You know, I often tell my patients that they're driving the car and I'm just the mechanic, so I can check in with them along the way, but by no means can our staff or our educators field every single call or make every decision about minute to minute and real time changes that need to happen during growth and puberty. So. I can imagine where it really empowers patients to really control their disease um, with a little help from us, but a lot more help from the algorithm. So you see AI as not just um, being part of the hospital or the clinic, but actually going home with the patient. Um, Emily, I know you do a lot of work in this space. Do you want to, to comment? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we're excited about as well. I think one of the challenges uh, focuses on sort of this problem of when you're trying to assess someone's health, you often have these, these snapshot visits and then trying to understand how maybe variations in someone's daily life are also contributing to changes or how variations in someone's daily life might tell you about the progression of neurodegenerative diseases. There's a lot you can learn by looking at someone's uh, behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what we're really excited about, and I think where AI really has the potential to shine, particularly when things like privacy are, are of prime concern, is, is thinking about how to, get, how to get the monitoring of symptoms or the monitoring of, of behaviors that might contribute to our understanding of disease, um, how we can do that passively, how we can avoid the need to have people fill out surveys and allow the technology to begin to interpret how changes might be occurring and then um, present these changes to, to people who are experts to understand what that might mean for uh, the progression of disease or for identifying ideal treatments or for understanding new medications that, that come online. So yeah. one, one thing to think about is what would the world be like in 50 years without AI? How would advances in other aspects of medicine change the landscape? And I think one of the things that has been brought up by the two prior speakers is 
that um, what that our ability to do real time sensing and um, in the home and other places might change a lot. So that the role of a doctor, even without AI, will change. And so I th so it suggests to me that. Uh, there might be less uh, hands-on care because um, 50 years is a long way away. So <laughs> that's not something that's not five years away, that's 50 years away. And so I think that's the key thing to keep in mind here and that I might become more of a manager for uh, what's being done to uh, what's being done in the home and, and keeping up with things from that way. And also be getting alerts. So right now, there's no data going from me day to day to my doctor. And I think that's one of the things that um, is gonna be happening more and more is that data th and there will be these privacy concerns, but uh, um, data that's being collected could be available to my doctor to then be looking at that, those longer term trends. But the AI systems will then be able to alert the doctor to uh, when thresholds are passed or whatever. So I think that might be a change. I think it's really, really hard to predict. Um, although if we look 50 years in the past as to what our doctors were doing and what they're doing now, things have changed, but they aren't, it's not that the doctor's role is completely different than what it was 50 years ago. So that always gives me pause to think 50 years in the past and ask if we're going to project in the future, do we expect there to be exponential change or is it just going to be similar to what we have. And I think that's very difficult to predict. I think there are going to be these areas like imaging and uh, monitoring that are going to um, have a, big changes, but it's hard for me to predict out, outside of that. Great. Right. Um, so that, that um, opens up a nice question that I'd like to get a reaction from um, the doctors. Um, perhaps, Ellie, you could take this one. It, it, Emily and John, you both um, talk about more data right, either through sensing or through actually passing more data to your clinicians. Um, Joyce and Ella, do you, wh what are you gonna do with all those data? And so just kind of a segue from the last question into that one. Um, you know, I'm a radiologist, so what we do is imaging. And you know, when I started out in radiology, they were pictures that you held, and now everything that we do is digital. Everything is a signal, everything is, is data you can make inference from. And if you think about the practice of medicine, I think about it as a radiologist, um, we're in the business of identifying signals and translating it to make meaningful um, conclusions to then be able to treat and heal patients or, and set them on a, you know, a future course of therapies. And everything we do in medicine is a signal. An x-ray has signals in it. A chest CT scan has signals in it. These are things that I, I do every day. And whereas now I may be looking at them, um, we, we have those kind of signals, as you said earlier, John, as things that are in the home. And um, what that kind of data, that, that massive amount of, as we think about mass quantities of data today, 50 years from today, what we think of mass quantities is gonna be minuscule. And so also projecting that into the future. So if we think about, much larger amounts of data, being able to be analyzed so much faster, we, we become super interpreters, super masters of interpolating, of interpolating data or having data served up to us in a way that we can act on without having to go down to the finer granular levels and the, unless we have questions or something is a disconnect or something doesn't seem right from that human experience of working with data. And it's as, as we see patients and we, we develop a mental construct around disease and frameworks and patterns that you know, may not be all completely duplicatable. Um, so I, I think it's a very exciting time in that way. And I also think that as we think about what we do and we think about we're concerned and that we might not be able to have jobs in the future and all those things, those are really secondary byproducts of emotional reactions. Um, but I think we, when we think about healthcare resource constraints now, which is a lot of a lot of which is basically people, people who work in healthcare as a research as a resource constraint. Machines, if you will, AI can help us get to a place where we can do more, but do it without with less humans, perhaps per interaction. And that large amount of data won't seem like a large amount of data in 50 years. So um, we get deluged with data right now. And I would tell you that we really don't have the capacity to deal with it all, right? Like the inbox gets filled. Um, 
We have like a number of clinic accounts that our educators need to go to, to to find the data. We have patients typing in or even taking pictures of their logbook and then sending it through the portal as an image. So um, I would say that we're in a pretty primitive stage of data, although we're definitely more advanced than the average clinician. Um, I think the reimbursement and time spent reading the data, that could be a huge advantage of computation because that's people, time, and cost. And if it were all interoperable, if it were all easy to sort of be extracted from the patient's devices, I think it would go a lot smoother and it would give us the opportunity to do, you know, super interpretation of 150 or 200 patients a day versus, you know, um, the smaller number that we tackle. So I think that, um, you know, the, the, the real integration really comes with implementation and, and there are a number of barriers to overcome with that. So I look forward to that future, but I would say, you know, calling the family to have them download, getting them to be, um, you know, even on a platform where we can see the data, trying to get them to do it before clinic, before our video visits, right? There are just so many barriers such that um, um, I hope that people understand that it's not just pure beautiful data, it's the work of getting the data and um, it's making the human systems and technology work together to make the data as simple as possible to, to get um, accurately and easily. Well, I, yeah. And, and I, I see one of the things that's going to be interesting in the short term or medium term is how does this all fit into people's workflow? How does the doctor's workflow? They have a certain workflow now, if that uh, means seeing patients or whatever. But as if you're going to see this transition from seeing the patients live and then getting other data, how are doctors going to adapt to that? and uh, doing all the things they already do, but also doing this extra data interpretation. Sorry, Emily, go ahead. No, 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 I think that's one of the really important parts about this multidisciplinary collaborative research, because it really forces all sides to work together to not only figure out what we can sense, but A, how it would be used and B, what we even care about. Because I remember when we first started in some of this work, I, I just had this vision that we would, we would distill aspects of behavior and just send data and data and data at clinicians constantly. And everyone would say, fabulous, we have so much information now. And I learned through time, that was what no one wanted. And so I think that through these conversations, what it actually leads to is just a better understanding of, of what we can measure and what would be helpful to measure. And you know, sometimes these conversations are challenging as an engineer at the beginning, because we just often have no idea. But that's one of the neat things also about taking kind of examples of, of types of technology that might exist that we could relate to and thinking about how that might look for other types of things we could measure. And so in our case, we do a lot of emotion sensing. Um, there's not a lot of emotion technology at the moment, but there are things like Fitbit, which tracks sleep. And so you can start to say, oh, so how would you use a sleep tracker in your, in your practice? What would that mean? Well, what, what would happen if you have access to other types of behavior? What would that mean? What would, what would you then want to see from us? What kind of frequency would you want? And not only does it inform what we measure, but it informs the fidelity with which we need to measure it. And it also informs how we think about summarizing the types of data that we collect. Great, Emily, so you mentioned that you do um, research in emotion, uh, which relates to my next question. Uh, many argue that we can't replace humans uh, in roles that require empathy, like patient care. Uh, why is it difficult to build AI that mimics empathy? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure everyone's toaster cares as much about them as I know my toaster cares about me. <laughs> so one of the challenges is that there, there's no common ground, right? Like our technology, it doesn't really understand where we're coming from. It doesn't understand our history. It doesn't understand the complexity of our problem. So empathy is challenging without all of those things. But I think that one of the things that we really should think about when we think about how technology can um, provide extra can enhance the way we're thinking about care currently is that it's not really about it shouldn't be about replacing people what it should be about is augmenting so how can we create technology that augments some, somebody's ability to understand their patients how can we create technology that gives people more awareness of their own health status so they could be proactive how can we create technology that allows people perhaps if we're going to go with emotion 
understands their own emotion processes and how that might relate to various aspects of health where things like emotion dysregulation uh, might be a challenge. But I think what we should not be targeting is replacing people. As it turns out, that is, I think, beyond 50 years ahead of us. <laughs> I think there, there's so much complexity in terms of how, how doctors, how clinicians in general are understanding their patients and are understanding what they have to measure. And to think that, that our, you know, our, our magic AI, MAI, if you will, uh, will be able to just bounce in and, and tackle all of that uncertainty, all of that ambiguity, all of that complexity, I think is, is, is really not where we wanna go. It's augmenting, it's supporting. Reactions to that? I agree with the augmenting. I, I'm not so sure that, and, and I, I totally understand the component about the doctor-patient relationship and the nurse-patient relationship and um, that uh, reading that emotional component and whether that's challenging or not to be able to replicate. I think if I look at my own field and I think about 50 years ago, you know, we didn't have ultrasound, we didn't have CT scanners, we didn't have x-ray, we didn't have PET machines, we didn't have optical imaging. And we know that the, pay, the rate of change of technology you know, continues to go faster and faster. So when I think about 50 years from now, I, I do agree with augmenting the interface between people and patients, people who work in healthcare and patients. I think there's going to be so much signal coming at us, as is already said, there's just so much signal right now. Just think of the amount of signal exponentially in the future the ability for that signal to be packaged, to be able to serve up in a, into a way to be more suggestive so that we're then interpreting a signal that's already been pre-interpreted, if you will, or put into, put into probabilities of disease um, and likely best next steps um, from sources of data that we don't even yet have available to us yet. You know, people weren't wearing their watch, you know, who had an Apple watch, you know, 10 years ago, um, who, so, I think there's going to be so much coming at us that we're going to need to rely on technologies to do some of the synthesis for us because we're overwhelmed already with signal. I'm going to just be a little look at the other perspective as our previous speaker talked about, which was that there's places where it, the question is not about replacing physicians or radiologists. It's providing a service that is not there now because it's, not, it's the it's, there's no people that are experts there. So there might be a lot of applications in places where we don't have doctors who can be empathetic and nurses who can be empathetic, where we have to find ways of delivering care. And so uh, this issue might be uh, there. And I, you know, empathy, uh, there's sort of different levels of thinking about it. There's the, I think the best case, possible case where you have someone who has actually been in the situation the person has been in and can uh, have a mo mental model of what they're going through. And even a doctor can't always do that because they haven't been in the medical situation the person is. And then you have somebody who's seen lots of people and sort of is able to build a model because they have experience with what those situations the people are. And um, I don't think in five or 10 years, but it could be in many years, we will be able to build systems that maybe don't have the kind of empathy you want, but they can fake it. And whether that's sufficient or whether we should say, no, we're never gonna do that because that's not really real empathy, um, I, I don't know. But I do think some of these possibilities will be there, especially for cases where we don't have doctors that can have the direct uh, human to human interaction that we, we all wish we had with our doctor. So maybe there's a placebo effect for empathy, even if it's not real. <laughs> even now we see chatbots that exist that try to do such things. There's one called Wobot, W-O-E bot, which is designed to provide kind of like a chatbot experience that would allow people to do reflection uh, with respect to mental health. And so there are efforts now. And I agree that if we, could, if we can augment places where it's lacking either um, in under-resourced communities or abroad, I think I agree that that's, that's a great use. The other piece that I wanted to just mention about empathy was just that um, as data gets into the hands of the consumer or the patient, the data can be perceived as judgmental, the data could be perceived as shaming, the data could 
make someone feel so terrible about themselves. Like I'm wearing a CGM right now and you know, whenever it goes beyond a certain level and the, the number turns yellow or orange, it's alarming, I'm a, right? It's disturbing. I'm a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So I do, think, I do think physicians need to be there to help individuals understand the patterns, understand the limitations of the data and provide compassion where needed uh, for diseases that are really hard to manage. Great. So we're talking um, a, a lot about data, a lot about um, sensing, and I think we all agree there will be more data, more types of data that we couldn't even have imagined um, in the future. Um, but will we be better at sharing it? So that's a huge barrier currently. Um, what should we do about it? Well, I mean, there's a lot of legislation that just got pushed back by a little bit <laughs> um, with regard to data sharing of health data, meaning electronic health record data, right? And I think that um, that has been difficult and arduous, I would say, as a profession um, and as an enterprise, but I would say that it's good for the system, right? Um, when I go into Care Everywhere and Epic, or I go into the Great Lakes Health Connect Health Information Exchange, it is quite remarkable to be able to see all of the, many of, all of the laboratory results, many of the imaging results, and a good amount of clinical information about the patient, right? So I don't think any clinician um, would think that sort of the hoarding or kind of um, closing off of data streams would be good for, for patient health. But I also want to acknowledge that so much of the data that is health data never gets into the EHR. So again, we download devices into a platform and it goes in as a PDF into the media tab. And we are, you know, orchestrating some sort of integration with our EHR, but that takes time, money and bandwidth and that doesn't even cover all the platforms that our patients use to download their devices. I guess I kind of think about that a little bit differently. If I think about like, what did I have as a kid, which hopefully wasn't that long ago, but what kind of technology did I have then? Um, didn't have an iPhone, didn't have a fax machine, had a black and white TV with antenna. Um, and the idea of technology integration, you know, what was that? So I see the acceleration of the ability to pull data together in a meaningful way, even though as clunky as our EMRs are today, I can't help that in 20 or 30 years, it'll be better. I, I'm concerned about more and more constraints being put on access to data. And then on the flip side, I also see things happening to increase access to data. I mean, we have the um, recent federal legislation that is now making the medical record more open to our patients. So no longer can we um, delay access to uh, clinic notes or radiology reports or blood test results unless we think it's going to cause harm to them before a physician intersects, interacts with it. So I think we're moving in the direction of more availability of our information to patients. And as patients have that information, there's gonna be more things that they're gonna to wanna to do with it and take ownership of how it's used. Uh, right now they don't have access to it. So their imaging data, um, their surgical data, their, their um, diabetes data, if they have access to it, they'll start to use it in ways that we're not using it if we don't, if we don't do it ourselves. Yeah, the other thing to think about is also removing stigma that might be associated with certain types of data. So there are a lot of restrictions around sharing data that might be related to somebody's mental health right now. And while it definitely produces some privacy, uh, it helps with things like privacy, it, it sort of further stigmatizes the idea of having certain types of illnesses. And so when we think about kind of opening up data, what we should also think about is what restrictions apply to one type of condition versus another type of condition might also mean for someone's reflection over what their own health status means. I'd like to flip the question a little bit on its head. Um, in some conversations I've had with people in the health industry, their biggest concern for burnout, uh, and this is what Jenna said, like on her second slide, is dealing with e um, electronic health records. And that, that whole process, which has you know, changed over the last 15 years, 
has really added a lot of stress to their lives. And so the question and could be, how can AI help that? And I don't have the answer to it, but that seems to be a huge problem in the medical field. And can, if we have AI systems involved in it, can that actually make it easier to get the, ac the data you need and, and want at a given time and, and make it easier to manage it? So um, I just think that's a, maybe it is a very tapped area. Clearly places like Epic are putting huge amounts of work into it, but uh, the, the stories you hear of even after a year of switching over to Epic, places are still getting by with um, workarounds is, and things like that. That seems to be an area where there needs to be work done to improve the system. And I often wonder, it's not gonna be the data-driven AI that we talk about in imaging and other areas, but there's a lot of different aspects of AI that could possibly play a role there. I guess I would add to that, that even the way our EHRs are structured, don't make it easy to extract the information that you might want to feed into AI algorithms. Um, you know, if I think of a major, uh, Michigan is a major quaternary academic medical center, and we have the way we structure our EMR, and then we have access to you know information from other health systems in, in the EMR in a basic text manner, in a separate partition that doesn't really intersect with the rest of the EHR, which is in fields that you can extract. Um, and in my specialty, radiology. I can look at radiology reports from across multiple different health systems on a patient. I can't see the images. So there's a lot of richness of information that's not even available as connected as we are. But, but I think that, I mean, that will change in the future and then I'll be able to have that information. We'll have more that's uh, better integrated, um, but it is very frustrating and clunky when uh, you're moving around different places to try and find information. And when it seems to take eight or 10 clicks to do what you think should just take one. Yeah, and then I, you know, we've done a lot of workflow, um, sort of health information workflow work inside pediatric diabetes. And I think to a great extent, what we've done is we've hardwired or we've kind of created structured fields where there weren't any. Um, and that gives us sort of the information we need to be able to do more stratifying and more identification of, of patients with particular needs. I mean, this whole concept of, um, the electronic health record, right? Our mental model of it has always been, oh, it's like, you know, Microsoft Word, except it's transported to this thing called the EHR. But, you know, to the extent that most of us are still using um, free text, I think is a big debility because you have a lot of cutting and pasting, um, which makes me worried about, you know, text-based or NLP kind of approaches to really understanding health because, um, you know, I, like I think we can, we can um, improve on the system. So I think it does require uh, clinicians doing a little bit of uh, a better use of the tool and providing even basic things like we can never tell who was a CF related diabetes versus a type one diabetes versus a type two diabetes. And you might say that you can pull it from the codes, but in fact, it's, it's not perfect, right? And so sometimes it is helpful to have that clinician defined category or level of risk, you know? And so to the extent that you have humans providing some of that data, kind of a structured data, but then also having perhaps the computer systems help with the overall inputting, I do think it is a team sport to get to the sweet spot on being able to leverage um, more of the detailed data that lives outside of, you know, medications, hospitalizations, studies, right? Those are the big categories. But when you're talking about a lot of rare diseases in particular, there's so much data that is absolutely missing and only exists inside of free text note. So that's, that's a great um, uh, segue into my next question. Um, so we've been talking a lot about um, the EHR, the electronic health record and health data there. Um, and hopefully eventually we'll be, get to the point where we're able to share those data, but there are a lot of data already available out in the wild. Um, like social media data and Twitter data um, that are readily shared. Um, would those data be useful to answer health questions? And what are the ethical considerations around that? Yeah, so there are just a huge number of resources. So 
actually Radha and I with, uh, actually I see Laura as an attendee also, I've been uh, I'm trying to understand how you can use some of these uh, data to understand either how people are expressing their own uh, mental health symptoms or how you can understand trends in mental health possibly as, a, how, as it relates to, I don't know, stimuli like COVID, who, kn who knows, who knows what recent examples we might have that might be interesting. But the point is that the, the interesting thing about these data is that you have people expressing themselves not from the perspective of necessarily trying to convey how they're doing, which is what you often have in the context of data collected within a clinic. Instead, you have people just discussing. They have, you have people um, expressing, you have people performing, depending on how you look at, at these types of data. But the interesting thing is then you get to ask sort of different questions about how to tease out aspects of behavior that might be related to whatever uh, medical condition that you're thinking about when that wasn't necessarily the goal of what someone was doing when they were expressing. And so from a machine learning standpoint, it, it ends up being a really interesting, sometimes extremely often extremely challenging problem because then you're looking for sort of subtle changes. So let's imagine you have uh, Reddit, for example, where you're able to track someone's profile over time. So what happens if all of a sudden they start talking about a new medication or start talking about a new mood condition or start talking about um, a new source of anxiety? How can you use longitudinal histories about a single person to better understand what their disease tra trajectory looks like? Or if you're thinking about Twitter, how can you use changes in how people are expressing language? So for example, maybe they're starting to use the word I much more than they used to, which might be a sign of depression. How can you recognize these subtle changes and allow and uh, have a way of associating back with some kind of underlying medical condition? Now, that last part's really hard often, especially in unstructured data, because you, you, you might not have any idea what their, their underlying conditions actually are. And so you kind of have these stage difficulties where not only are you trying to recognize something that might be more subtle because it's not necessarily expressed with the purpose of conveying health, but you also might have uncertainty that's coming from not really knowing if the population that you're working with truly are, would be diagnosed, for example, with major depressive disorder or are expressing symptoms of depression, but don't actually have that diagnosis. And so where it leaves us often is really trying to carefully think about how you can curate these data sets in the wild, which we just generally mean outside of labs or outside of clinics, in a way that gives you some kind of certainty for what you're actually trying to measure while still allowing for the variability that makes the data so interesting. Am I the only one that this really creeps out? I mean, this <laughs> it seems extremely scary to me to have the, because if you have this ability to do it for patients, um, do you have this ability to do it for uh, loved ones who don't really know you're doing it or competitors in business? or political competitors or whatever. So I don't know, this disturbs me that uh, this kind of thing could happen. And so I, I would think that uh, if it becomes a long, you would, there will be a need for a lot of privacy and data management uh, things to happen. So anyway, I guess that's my, I can see the positive, Emily. So that, that yeah. looks great. I can see the positive, so I don't want to be negative about it all, but I just can also see how it can apply in a lot of other situations that um, are not, where the people's goals are not to help the individual. Yeah, so I'll tell the story vaguely because I don't necessarily have permission of the, the person who I'm talking about, but I'll, I'll say it vaguely. So we, so now in conferences, there's often a board an ethics board that looks at the research that you're proposing to make sure that you're not proposing to do things that are just, that are that just say inappropriate. And because so many of these sources of data exist, you, as John just said, you could gather them all together and make claims about people who might be public figures, but who might not really have authorized that type of analysis. So for example, there is a famous person, we'll call that person person, and this person has a condition that is public knowledge. And this person admitted this condition at a certain point in time, but didn't, uh, didn't necessarily authorize research to just go back and look through this person's history of posted data to try to figure out if that condition should have been diagnosed earlier. So there's a researcher who did this 
and found earlier examples of when uh, this person actually maybe should have been diagnosed with a condition but wasn't. And the conference said, no, you actually have to get permission from that person before we'll publish it. That person said no. And so that paper never got published. And so the, the point of the story is that, yes, you have to be extremely careful. And I think that that's, that's what's so important about having people like the, the IRB. It's what's important about having the ethics boards as parts of uh, conferences. It's the important of having any kind of ethics board that's part of industry research as well. Because just because you can do something, just because there are positives, doesn't mean that you should be doing this all the time without consideration for what the impact either on a person, on that person's family, a social circle, loved one, work environment, whatever, might have um, when we start thinking about how these data are actually used. Yeah, I guess I'm in a field where uh, we have better signals or sensors, right? So we have that privilege. So I think I'd rather just see the CGM data than look at the series of TikTok videos that have been viewed in the last two weeks. But, you know, I, mean, I suppose it could be helpful. <laughs> I want to see that paper written. <laughs> it, it does kind of get back to kind of the craziness when you think about, uh, you know, right now U.S. healthcare systems are under a cybersecurity alert, um, and there's all sorts of signals yep. um, that bring this up. This is not the first time that this has happened. Um, the more data there is, the more data there is to be hacked. Um, whatever data there is, you know, it's not always used for for the best purposes, and even those who don't intend harm. Um, outside of healthcare, um, we'll use information and we'll have access to tools. I mean, if I just think about something as simple as a, a digital photograph, you know, going from printed photographs to a digital photograph without a camera, um, and then all the apps that have popped up, um, to all the things you can do with that photograph um, and change the way a person looks and do everything from, you know, interesting and helpful and creative to really goofy. Um, that's just one image. It in, sits in the public domain and people can do stuff with it. Um, the more data that's out there that is um, under potential attack, the more things that people will be able to do with it outside of the healthcare domain. And that, that's what really scares me is all of this information is great. I think we can do great public health good, whether it's um, for underserved communities or parts of the world that don't have access to the um, physicians and nurses and technologists and healthcare workers um, and even do better and maybe help reduce expense in countries that do have more people doing that kind of work. But it really scares me to think about what could happen with data not in the right place and in the wrong hands. So data makes you, having data makes you a target, um, but having data also opens up the door to um, a wide range of possibilities in AI. Um, so if we think about um, collecting data and streams of data and how uh, that varies across the world or even this country, um, how might AI for health um, lead to increases or decreases in the equity uh, of health outcomes um, across the world or even, even in this country. Yeah, I, this is an incredibly important area. Um, when we start thinking about building algorithms, particularly algorithms that will deploy and algorithms will, whose insights we'll use to make health decisions, then we have to, have to, have to think about the impact of incorrect decisions on the communities that, that might be affected by these. A classic example of this we've seen in, in news quite a bit is about facial recognition or facial emotion recognition technologies. And the challenge is that groups of people um, tend to be associated with anger. So for example, if you look at black women, they tend to have uh, misclassifications of anger when anger is not the relevant label. And so if you're using emotion recognition as a way to understand if someone's mental health is changing with this assumption that if you see more evidence of anger, it might, it might be indicating um, some kind of negative mental health uh, consequence, then you have a population who, because of misclassification, is now either targeted for interventions that might not be needed or, depending on the level of surveillance, might also be associated with any kind of other uh, negative consequences from not getting jobs to um, challenges with parole to challenges at any number of things. And so 
The issue is that if we're not careful about how we're designing these, and if we're not thinking about how design challenges, and I'm not talking about data challenges, I mean specifically design challenges from the algorithmic standpoint, if we're not thinking about how those decisions themselves could be biased, then we're setting up entire communities to not be helped by these technologies, but instead targeted by these technologies. And so I think one of the critical things that we have to think about, particularly in that we are at a research institution, is thinking about how we, we use this as a way of um, using it as a teaching moment to try to explain to students how you have to think about um, designing algorithms that will be less subject to these types of biases, how you talk to communities that might be that might be targets for these types of biases to understand how they see the use case. And it's only through really thinking deeply about this that we can make sure or that we can have a greater confidence that when we deploy these things, these technologies <laughs> provide good rather than harm. But the other, the last point I'll make before I stop talking is that the other thing that we have to really make sure that we're doing is that we're not just creating technology and throwing it out there and saying, oh, I just, I hope that works. I did my job, I made my algorithm, I trained it up and now it's gone. We have to make sure that we're continuing to engage with the communities, whether the communities be uh, medical professionals who are using the algorithms or the communities who are monitoring disease as a function of these algorithms to make sure that they are, that the, they are to, performing in an equi equitable way and aren't just uh, creating problems for communities that they're meant to help. Joyce, I'm curious um, what you think about this because even though it's not necessarily AI, there's still technology and it impacts patients in different ways um, it, who have uh, type one diabetes, whether you have a CGM and you have an insulin pump or you don't. Yeah, so um, when I think about health disparities, I will tell you, um, as you will see in many clinics across the country, that um, our kids who are African American don't fare as well in terms of glucose control as our Caucasian population. And then the same goes for insurance, right? Um, private insured individuals um, do better than publicly insured individuals. And I think we understand that there's many reasons for this, right? There are social determinants of health, but the question becomes, how do some of those differences in outcomes um, really, how do we collect information to get to the bottom of that instead of just saying, I can't change my patient's race and I can't change my patient's insurance status. So just to give you an example, you know, we started with our kind of workflow transformation to really measure um, self-management habits, right? And so what we were able to do was look at things like how many times you bolus a day or wear a CGM? How many times do you um, uh, check your blood sugar? How many times do you um, bolus before you eat, right? So very basic questions that were never ever measured in a structured way. And I think what we've been able to see is that, you know, you if you break those kind of components down into what we call our six habits of diabetes management, like you will see the exact same pattern in the white children as in the black children. It's just that um, a preponderance of, of some of our kids, our minority kids, like need more help with some of those behaviors. So I think what I, what I think is an interesting opportunity is to sort of use computing to identify patterns that help us make actionable action for our populations instead of just assuming that health disparities exist and we can't do anything about them. It's, you know, COVID showed us, showed us really, having a COVID pandemic really brought to the surface health inequities. And we saw this in many ways. We've certainly seen COVID disproportionately impacting certain communities, particularly African-American and Hispanic communities. Um, and part of that is related to social determinants of health. But we think about how the healthcare systems responded to COVID. So we, we kind of locked down, we eliminated in-person elective care, and we immediately fast forward into a virtual technology platform, which, you know, face value, great. We've been trying to get doctors to do virtual health and, and make that switch, um, and it happened. And people did it quickly, and they saw it as an ability to reach their patients. Well, what also happened is that people who didn't have technology to be able to interface for, for a virtual telehealth visit didn't have access. And we were doing telephone visits for them. We were calling them on the phone to do our doctor patient visits. Uh, and then we kind of did it. So we had differential access. We found patients whose 
only access to Wi-Fi to be able to have a virtual visit was to go to a McDonald's. But the McDonald's was closed, so they didn't have their free Wi-Fi access anymore because the communities around them didn't have community Wi-Fi. And then we saw related to billing issues, um, um, trying to no longer use phone visits because they're not reimbursed, which while we all understood bringing people into virtual health um, where you can see and interact with them um, or bring them in in person was being pushed because of a reimbursement um, conundrum, not be able to have simple telephone visits, which are lower technology available because they weren't reimbursed was a problem. So there's so many um, disconnects in access to technology, access to the uh, ability to access technology through Wi-Fi and platforms that people don't have that impacts health that we didn't really think about as we rushed into virtual health. And as we look about the national structure for reimbursement about different types of visits that can create inequities. So we're almost out of time. Um, this has been great so far. I'd like to end um, with one last question, which I, I'd like to ask each of you to, to quickly comment on what you see um, uh, either the biggest challenge in AI is or the biggest challenge um, in medicine that AI could potentially help solve. Um, John, you look like you have an answer. No, I don't. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, that's exactly I, the biggest. I don't, I mean, there's lots of problems. Problems, pick one. So, so um, I think, you know, getting semantics out of language to me is going to be a game changer. Right now we have our language models and they, uh, per, you know, we can get syntactic representations or we can get them to be mapping from pictures to language or whatever, but we can't get them to create a representation of the meaning that's grounded in, and maybe in a scene that then can be used by other aspects of a um, AI system to reason about what was said. And a lot of the emphasis in AI has been on going from data to data or data to categorization. And that works great, but a lot of times people do more than that. They do they're able to go from you know, language to do some thinking about the language and then to um, action in the world or creating other action. So uh, I see that it, it would be a gr great game changer if we had the ability to do a much more general natural language. Now that is often what's called an AI complete problem that all, in order to solve it, you almost have to solve all the other aspects of AI, um, but still, uh, and, but I, I do think we can keep cutting away at it or making progress on it. And I do think that will have applications to medicine that was brought up earlier is that um, a lot of text in um, e, um, EHRs is unstructured. And so there's a lot more unstructured text in the world than there is structured text. And although we're seeing progress with things like transformers what they do is just sort of um, start to generate text as opposed to really understand it. So that's my fine. Uh, that's today's. That, that's great. I think that, that ties in nicely to our, our um, discussion around interaction, right? So once you facilitate that interaction between human and AI or doctor and AI, um, there's way more possibilities. Right now it's very clunky through the EHR system. Um, so I'm sure that uh, doctors would, would love that. The other, well, so not just interaction, but knowledge transfer. Transferring knowledge between humans and computer and, and computer and human. So yep. that's the, the means we use. And so it'd be great to be able to support that. Uh, from my side, I think one of the greatest challenges is trying to think about how we, how we come up with labels for diseases that are very difficult either to categorize or to describe as really being present or absent. So what does it mean to have a mental health condition? It doesn't mean that every single time you express yourself, you're depressed. It's not at all what it means. And so really thinking about how we can take labels that describe conditions and think about how we operationalize them to allow our systems to understand how to interpret the underlying signals. Yeah, labels come up all the time. And just in the previous talk, right? Um, even when it comes to diagnosis, 
um, coming up with good labels is critical. Joyce or Ella? I would say just uh, one of the real practical challenges that we have is interoperability of putting things into practice. You know, EMRs are clunky, IT frameworks are clunky, resources are challenging. Um, you can do a lot of great work. You can show that something's working. You can show that you can pre-detect disease or you can pull things out of the EMR and predict the probability of an event happening. But the ability to actually convince people to put the resources behind putting them in place, and those resources can be substantial in a, in a healthcare system, it's a big obstacle to overcome when you're competing with things like, can we afford to put up a healthcare facility in another location? Can we afford to replace imaging equipment that's 15 years old um, with newer ones that can take better pictures and show us more? So making sure that we can make the case that there's value at the end of the day for integration of, of these kinds of tools um, is a high bar to be able to get the resources to implement. And I, I fear that the challenges in intersecting between the tools and healthcare systems and IT operations and capital restrictions will make it really hard to move these things forward, even if they're ready. So I wholeheartedly agree with you, Ella, right? So I think I'll end on saying that I want to reduce the work of data. I want to reduce the work on the patients. I want to reduce the work on the admins and the CDEs and the doctors. Um, and then when that data gets into a place and gets integrated with other things, reduce the work that it takes to clean it, to combine it, to analyze it, to interpret it. So that's your challenge, <laughs> Jenna. And colleagues. Awesome. Great. Now, now, we have, now we have our challenges. We're going to get to work. Um, well, thank you all for joining um, this afternoon. It's been a great discussion. Um, this was recorded, so it will be made available um, later through our YouTube channel. Um, before we conclude this, uh, this was the last session. So before we conclude the symposium, I wanted to share the winner. Um, of our po best poster award. So let me see if I can share my screen. Well, Jenna, while you're doing that, thank you for everything you've done. Yeah. This has been oh, wonderful. Thank you. All right, so the winner is Roshanak Mazari um, from Michigan State University, um, along with their co-author. So congratulations um, to Roshanak. Right. And um, with that, I would like to give a big thank you to, you know, all of our panelists, all of our presenters, all of you, the attendees for joining us. Um, a lot of planning went into this event um, to, that made it possible. Uh, and for that, I'd like to thank Mira and Christine, our poster chairs, Aura, and of course, um, our, my co-chair, um, Radha Michalsha. Um, without them, this, this event wouldn't have been possible.